This evening, uh, we are looking at, uh, well, again, we're looking at a topical study, which means that uh, we're not going to be so much exegeting a particular passage, but using it rather to introduce the subject. It, it will, the, the passage, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, will be integral to one of the points we're looking at, but it won't include everything we're going to be looking at. We're, going, we're, we're looking at why we believe love is important. And it's not that we think that other Christians don't think it's important. Again, this series is meant to show why we hold certain things uh, to be uh, well, important, where we think that perhaps others aren't uh, putting as much emphasis on them, but really why love is important for us personally, uh, as far as our salvation, because it has to be there. Uh, certainly, uh, with regard to what we offer to the Lord, has to include love, but also how we treat one another as members of the body of Christ when we disagree or when we give offense. So let's begin by uh, just simply reading a few verses of 1 Corinthians 13, although we should certainly read this whole chapter, as it describes for us the kind of love the Spirit of God produces in our hearts. But again, we're going to look or just read verses 1 through 3. Paul writes, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now, again, I mentioned that last week we were looking at why we believe truth to be important, why we believe all of God's truth to be important, but particularly those fundamental truths of the gospel. If you misunderstand those things, or if you understand them, but you, of course, don't believe them, the Bible says you will not be saved. There are certain things that you have to believe are true in order to make it into heaven, or to truly be trusting in Jesus Christ to get you into heaven. You do have to believe that he exists, of course. You have to believe that he lived and that he died, that he rose again from the dead and that he was seen by many witnesses, as Paul summarizes the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. And of course, there are other things that go into this, the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, because if you didn't believe that, then how could you believe the things that the Word of God tells you regarding the gospel, or regarding God and what God is like, the true God, or our Lord Jesus Christ, to make sure that we're trusting in the Jesus of the Bible, the one who is both God and man, and of course, following the way of salvation, which is that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone in his righteousness, his obedience, and his death on the cross in order to save us. These things define the gospel. This is what the gospel is. These are the truths God uses to save us. By the way, I just remind you again, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. These truths are what God makes powerful to save us and to bring us to heaven. Now we also saw the rest of God's truth is also important, even though it may not be as essential for our salvation, it is important. Whenever we believe anything that is contrary to the truth, even though it may not kill us spiritually, it can't because we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, yet it's still going to hurt us in some way. It's going to hurt not only us, but it's going to hurt other people that we influence with those things, that they believe the same thing. And to some degree, it is going to dishonor the Lord. Now, again, we recognize certainly disagreements exist within the body of Christ, which is why I want to follow up on that point with something that I just sort of introduced last time, but I think it's... it's certainly worth looking at in more detail. And that is because there are so many who make even minor differences of opinion of Scripture to be points of division. We need to 
to understand what God thinks about this and how it is we're supposed to respond when we do uh, disagree with one another. I mean, I don't think there are any two people in the whole world that agree on everything that the Bible says. And certainly among the differing Christian denominations, there's a great deal of differences of opinion. And of course, you know that um, not everyone necessarily believes that that should divide us as the body of Christ. It's one of the things that I want us to consider as sort of an auxiliary point and perhaps something that maybe must, well, should be more central because Solomon tells us that division is something that God actually hates. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, again, the list of six things, although there's certainly more than six things that God hates, but these are singled out. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Now, again, there's many ways in which that can happen, but one of those ways is by perhaps placing too great of a premium on the fact that we differ on this particular point and excluding one another from the kingdom of heaven because of that. Now, that we disagree on many different things is really inevitable because we are still far from perfect, and our understanding of the scriptures on this side of heaven is going to be far from perfect, so we need to be careful how we deal with these disagreements, that we don't destroy the unity which the Spirit of God is creating between the different members of Christ's body. Now, we may disagree with other Christians on a number of issues, but if they are trusting the same Savior that we are trusting, then they have become a part of the same body of which we are a part, which means that they are actually members of us. We are a part of the same body. They are our members. We are going to be spending eternity with them in heaven. Jesus Christ owns them. We, we have to be careful. Now, we may be divided on what the Bible teaches. Certainly we are in a number of areas, but our hearts should not be divided. Now, again, love is essential for several different reasons. Certainly this is one of them, but I did want to consider three things under this topic this evening, that love is important for these three reasons. First of all, it's important because it's essential to our salvation. We cannot be saved without love. Secondly, because without love, nothing we do is going to be acceptable to God. And then thirdly, it's important that we love, or love is important because it is the cement that holds the body of Christ together. So first of all, love is important because we cannot be saved without love. Now, we do need truth. We do need the gospel. But to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, as our meditation reminds us, we have to have love. You know, there's a little bit of debate going on as far as what that passage means. You know, in, in Christ, either circumcision or uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. As a matter of fact, uh, Bob Strimple at Westminster Seminary was uh, uh, giving a, a story that, that had taken place, I think, while he was in seminary at Westminster East, and I think Van Til was teaching. They brought up this passage. They were debating what it might possibly mean. One of the students raised his hands. He goes, I know. I have the answer. And the bell rang. And the class was over, and so they never actually found out <laughs> what the answer to the question was. But I do believe that that particular point is central to one theologian that I, I you know, very highly admire, that's Jonathan Edwards. That what he is saying is that not that faith produces love, but that love produces faith. I think that's what the religious affections is all about. The idea that what gives rise to faith is this work of the Holy Spirit producing love in our hearts for the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why we trust Jesus Christ, the reason why we receive him as our Lord and Savior is because the Spirit of God has put this love in our hearts. Now that's not strange to, to us because we've heard that a number of times. The Holy Spirit is the love of God. And the fruit that he produces in our hearts is love. 
We're told in the book of Hebrews that the, the work of the Spirit of God of the New Covenant is to take the law of God and write it on our hearts. Paul says again that the principle of the Spirit is fulfilling the law of God in us in Romans chapter 8. In other words, he is producing this love within us that desires to do what God commands us to do. If we don't love God, the scripture says, if we don't love our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, John tells us that we don't even know him. Love is essential to our being Christians. We're not saved, of course, by our love. This love is a gift God gives to us. It is the evidence of regeneration, of the new birth, that we are true believers, from which all the other evidences flow, primarily, of course, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, who, in fact, saves us by his righteousness. Now, again, we're not saved by love. We're saved by Christ. We're certainly saved by love, which is not our own, the love of God, who sends the Son into the world to save us. Though for us, it is the evidence that we are truly born again. That's why the Lord will look for that on the day of his judgment to see if it is in our hearts and if it is being expressed toward the Lord's people because that is how we show love to Christ is by loving his people. So again, that's the first point. Love is essential to our salvation. We can't be saved without it. We're not saved by it, but we can't be saved without it. Secondly, love is important because Nothing that we do for the Lord will be acceptable to him unless it has love, unless that's the motive behind it. And again, that's what Paul was telling us in our passage here. He says that we can have great benefits, we can have great blessings, we can have great gifts, the greatest gifts that God has ever given. The ability to speak in the, perhaps the most difficult languages in the world, the tongues of men or even the tongues or the languages of angelic beings. We can have the gift of prophecy, which by which he means either the ability to foretell the future, at least as God gives you that word, or to proclaim God's word with, with power, to you know, uh, not foretell, but foretell his word. The ability to understand things which were hidden by God, the mysteries of God, perhaps things hidden in the Old Covenant that have been revealed in the New, or some things in the New are even difficult to understand, but God could reveal those things to you, or even to understand very clearly what it is that God has already revealed to understand those things, and even to have the gift of faith that is so powerful that you speak to this mountain and it moves from this place to another. He said you can have all these things, but if you don't have love, the love the Spirit of God produces, then all of these things are meaningless to God. As a matter of fact, worse than meaningless. These things are actually offensive to him. Speaking in these languages, as it were, even the wonderful works of God, to him would be a noise in his ears if we don't have love. It's less than nothing in his sight. Is it even possible to have these gifts and, and not to have this love? Well, certainly that's what... Paul is implying here, and as a matter of fact, we have a wonderful example in Scripture of one who actually exercised the gifts, who went out and preached the gospel, who healed the sick and raised the dead and did everything that the other 11 did, and yet is in hell today because he never knew the Lord, and that is, of course, Judas. Now, Paul goes on to say we can even make the greatest sacrifices possible to God. We can give all of our possessions to feed the poor, which is what Jesus, of course, called the, the rich man to do, and he was unable to do because he loved his riches too much. and He didn't love Jesus. We can give everything up as he commanded, and we can even die the death of a martyr, making the greatest sacrifices possible. But if there is no love in these things for the Lord, if we don't do them for him because we love him, then these things too are meaningless and they, we gain nothing from them. And the Lord certainly is not pleased. Now think about what we saw this morning of the importance of ministering to Jesus and how the Lord actually gives that as a priority over ministering to those outside the church. We minister to Jesus by ministering to his people. But if we're going to do that in a way that is honoring to the Lord, in a way that he will accept, 
This love has to be there. We have to do it out of a love for Him, to honor Him, not, because, not just because we love one another, although that is important, not just because we love ourselves, because we're looking, as it were, to the reward, although God promises a reward, and we do need to love one another, but we need to love the Lord. If we're going to love one another in the way we should love one another, we have to have this love of God. If this love isn't there, then what we do for the Lord is unacceptable. So again, love is essential to our salvation. And secondly, love must be present in everything we do. It has to be the motive for what we do. Otherwise, it, what we do is not acceptable to God. Now finally, love is important because it is the cement that holds the body of Christ together. Sometimes in the name of love for God and a zeal for His glory, we actually attack other people who are the Lord's. Jesus warned His own disciples that that was going to happen to them as they went out to minister to God's people, the Old Covenant people of Israel. Jesus said in John 16, verses 1 through 2, These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Now, the Lord had commanded them, they had commanded Israel, even in the Old Covenant, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But these were actually going to kill in the name of God, thinking they were doing God's service, thinking that they were honoring him. Now, why did Jesus say they would do this? He says in verse 3, These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. And the word known there, as you probably know, doesn't mean it's not that they didn't know about him. It's not that they didn't know who the covenant God of Israel is, but that they didn't know him in a personal relationship. They did not love him. That's the reason why they were going to attack and kill those who were following the Messiah. Now, maybe we wouldn't go so far today as to kill somebody who disagrees with us. At least I hope not. But we do need to remember what the Lord says, that if we hate our brother in our hearts, that we are murdering them in our hearts. 1 John 3.15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, we do need to understand he doesn't mean by that that you don't sometimes get irked at your brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe sometimes get angry. This is talking about hating them and you know, continuing on with this hatred and bitterness. This is practicing a sin, which the Lord tells us is inconsistent with the love that he puts in our hearts. The Lord does not give us that option to hate our brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what denomination they may be in, regardless of our past history with them. He doesn't give us the option to hate anyone, even our enemies. The Lord tells us we need to love our enemies. If we are at odds with a brother or sister, the Lord tells us we actually need to go to them and be reconciled to them before we come and presume to worship the Lord. We need to make sure that whether they're the offended one or whether they're the one who's given the offense, that we go to them. We at least need to try to be reconciled to them. And sometimes you can't because you try and the other person doesn't want to forgive you or doesn't want to repent of what they've done. They just won't listen. So that's why Jesus says, as much as it depends upon you, you be at peace with all men. If you can't reconcile with them, the problem needs to be with them and not with you. It can't be your sin issue. And of course, if we go to our brother or sister and we can't be reconciled to them, then we need to keep praying for them until the Lord changes their hearts and grant this reconciliation. Now, the reason I bring this up is not just because you know, truth is the only thing that divides us. There are other things that divide us as well, even slight offenses. 
but it's only because having been a pastor for 20 years, I have seen a great deal of division taking place even within one denomination and within one church. So much bitterness, so much hatred, so much separation or separating, dividing, slandering and backbiting within the church of Christ. Sometimes it seems like there's more of it in the church maybe than in the world, although I'm sure that isn't true, but it's just that I get to see what's going on in the church perhaps more than I get to see what's going on in the world. But Jesus did remind us on one occasion, the world loves its own. And there is a sense in which they do love one another, but they also, of course, hate, backbite, and do all these things as well. But the point is, many times the church doesn't love its own. And our Lord tells us there's no excuse for this. There's, there's not even an excuse, because we do this sometimes as well, telling, even telling the truth about somebody else, not slandering them, but using the truth to turn other people against them, exposing their weaknesses and sins, the things we ought to be covering over. Instead, we expose them because of anger, because of hatred, because of bitterness. The Bible says, God tells us, that he hates this kind of, of activity, this kind of, of heart, this, this hatred, this division, this slandering, this backbiting. Now, again, the reason why the church is so divided I would have to say this, is, is not just because we have differences in what we believe. But I think it's how we handle those differences. We just don't love one another as the Lord tells us that we should. In the name of truth, we turn against one another when the Lord was, as tells us that he wants us to love one another and work with one another and use our gifts, as it were, dialogue, and, and work through these issues until we all come to a unity of the faith, until we all agree in order that we might serve the Lord better. And by the way, a lack of love is also the reason why we, we can't seem to overcome or overlook even the slightest offenses that people commit against us, even our brothers and sisters. The Lord wants us to be filled with his spirit. We're talking about the importance of love here. Why is it important? Well, love is what is able to overcome these things. Love is able to embrace a brother or sister in Christ even if they disagree with us and receive them as a brother or sister in Christ. Love is able to cover over the, the small offenses and when there are large offenses, love is able to work through the process that is necessary to bring about reconciliation. The reason why we have these divisions is not just because we disagree with what the Bible says, but it's because we don't love as we should. Now again, how important is this love? Well, we've already seen that apart from love, we will not see heaven. You know, this love that is able to overlook slight offenses and even work through larger offenses to reconciliation, this love that is willing to embrace a brother even if they happen to disagree with us, is the kind of love that the Lord gives to us in conversion, the kind that transforms us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kind that has to be there. Otherwise, the Lord tells us that we won't see heaven. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 3.10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Does that mean that I can, I can love, you know, nine brothers out of ten and I'm okay, or 99 out of 100? Well, I think John means here that we do need to love them all because they are brothers in Christ. He goes on to say in verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. That's, John is saying, that's, that's the test of our Christianity, is whether or not we love the brethren. The Spirit of God has put that love in our hearts for Christ. As we're reminded by the sheep and goat judgment, we will love those who are Christ, and we will minister to their needs. It's, it's a contradiction to say we love the Lord, but to hate our brother. He says elsewhere in uh, this letter of 1 John. 
Love is important because it's essential to our salvation. We must have it. It's essential because without it, nothing we do for the Lord is ever going to be accepted. It's just going to be noise. It's going to be an offense to him, even the greatest sacrifices. And without this love, of course, we're just going to divide. We're just, we're just going to become embittered against one another. It is the cement that holds us all together. So you need this love. This love is important. How do you get this love? Well, there's certainly only one way to get it, and that is through the work that God has done through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, as a matter of fact, the gift of God. It's something that he does. But you know, of course, you have it when you're able to trust the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart because you love him, and you turn from your sins because you hate them, and you turn toward righteousness because you love righteousness. You know, if that isn't in your heart, the only place you can go is to the Lord. You need to come to him and, and ask him for that grace. Pray till the Lord changes your heart. Now, if you do have this love already, how do you strengthen it? How do you get more of the influence of the Holy Spirit? Well, again, you know very well by now how to do that. Feeding your soul on the means of grace turning from those things that, that sap that strength, that sap the spirit away from you, the world and sin and all those things. We need this love. We need a stronger love. Obviously, as you look at the church around us, fragmented in so many different denominations, and again, looking at one another with suspicion, and also, again, all the bitterness and division that exists within the church. The church needs more love, or we might even say the church, many in the church need love to begin with because there are those in the church who really do not know the Lord. But we, remember, have no excuse. We cannot uh, hate anyone. That is not an option for us. We must love them. So if you lack that love, come to Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can put that love in your heart. If you do have that love but find yourself struggling in these areas, you still need to come to the Lord. Use the means he's given to you to ask for his help to gain more of the Spirit of God that you might be able to love in the way that the Lord calls you to love so you can still embrace brethren who don't exactly agree with you. And you're not going to get so upset when the smallest offenses are committed against you. Pray and seek the Lord for a greater love. Well, may the Lord show us the importance of love at least to the point where we seek after it more, seek after him for more of it. Let, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to do that for us.